This is Winchester Academy. Oh, that's good. That's fine. As long as the uh, illustrations are all right. Um, there's a old adage started in European history. No documents, no history. So when you read a history, whether you're a grade school student or what I like to refer to you as an ICA, intellectually curious adult, where did that information come from? Well, historians, scholars, have used documents over the years to create history. History isn't what happened, it's the interpretation of the documents. And that's why over time, history, and this, history evolves. It's because people ask different questions of the documents. I have been involved for 30 years in what's called documentary editing taking the documents, the raw documents, producing volumes like this for scholars. These are from the Adams Papers. You don't want to look at these. <laughs> these are doorstops. <laughs> They're dense. They have 50-page indexes because people are using them for research. But we also produced other volumes for ICAs, the more attractive volumes that are selected from the documents that we have worked on. And they're distilled. They're, they, don't, they don't have all of the apparatus that scholars look for. And I'm going to talk about two of, uh, generally about two of the volumes tonight, two of the, two of the collections of papers. Um, I worked for uh, about 14 years at the Massachusetts Historical Society in Boston. It's the oldest historical society in the United States, founded in 1791. So, they are just winding up their celebration of their 225th anniversary. It's an amazing place. In the years that I was there, I saw some of the most things would be brought out for display, and you would think, that can't be real. For example, my grandson, when he was in middle school, went there, and the curator brought out, because he was studying about the Civil War, the noose that John Brown was hung with. Kind of creepy, but real. Um, things, things like that that you don't think could, could still exist. Over the years, from the, almost the founding of the Massachusetts Historical Society, the Adams family, the family John and Abigail and uh, other generations played a significant role in that organization. One of the most important people in the Adams family with the Massachusetts Historical Society was Charles Francis Adams II. He was John and Abigail's great great grandson. And he was the president of the society at the end of the 19th century. The collection had become so large that they needed a new building. So they built, he picked the land, he raised the money, <coughs> hired the architect. Other than that, he didn't do too much. <laughs> Beautiful building. The society is still there today. Classic building in the back bay. 
Charles Francis Adams and his brothers that you may know more of. Ever heard of Henry Adams? Brooks Adams, those were two of his brothers. They were holding a huge collection of Adams papers that had accumulated over the generations. Have any of you ever visited the uh, Adams estate? It's now a, a national park site outside of Boston. Lovely place. Anyway, the papers were stored there. To give you an idea of the collection, there's 300,000 pages in the collection. They never threw anything away. <laughs> As time went by, these brothers, these three brothers, who were very interested in history, one the president of the Historical Society, the two other historians themselves, were concerned that theft, fire, insects, they didn't have the best security to maintain those papers. So Charles Francis, the, the building opened in 1899, and they moved the entire collection in 1902 to that building. <coughs> they didn't give the papers to the society, and one of the reasons they did keep a close, they, they, they kept the papers closed because it wasn't just, oops, it wasn't just revolutionary period papers. It was the papers right up until that time. And one of the things that you, if you know anything about the Adamses, they were outspoken. <laughs> and it just came through in their correspondence and in their diaries. And what they were afraid of, what that generation was afraid of, is that people who were still alive that the Adamses, that the later generations had talked about. So what they did is they put a significant letter. You flip to the next page, there's two, there's two pages to it. Uh, slide her down a little bit. OK. He wrote, before I end my letter, I pray heaven to bestow the best of blessings on this house and all that shall hereafter inhabit it May none but honest and wise men ever rule under the roof. Okay. That is a famous saying, not just because John Adams said it, but Franklin Roosevelt loved this so much that he has this inscribed, had this while he was president, inscribed in gold, still there, above the fireplace in the state dining room. White House. I guess you could tell I like John and Abigail. <laughs> Would you flip again? The Swan. This is a very flattering portrait, I can assure you. Um, have you heard of John Singleton Cop Copley? He is one of the famous portrait painters of the era. He was in London at that time, friends of the Adamses. John Quincy was in London on a diplomatic uh, uh, mission, and he had this done for his mother. It is very favorable, I can, I can assure you. Um, John Quincy, interesting chap. I think the greatest public servant in American history. His career, I think, is unmatched. When he was 14 years old, he had his first assignment. He went to Russia. The man who was selected to be our minister to Russia, although the Russians never accepted him, he was there for a year, and the, the Russians would speak to him. Uh, didn't speak French. And French was the international diplomatic language of the period. So who would you have that spoke fluent French? John Quincy Adams. 14 years old, he went as secretary to the minister. 
Got an early start. <laughs> Over the years, he was a senator, U.S. senator. He was our minister to the Netherlands, to Prussia, to Russia, to England. He was Secretary of State, President. We are, our president that's going out is pretty young, isn't he? What do you think he's going to do after that? <laughs> what will Obama do? John Quincy Adams, after he left the presidency, went back to Congress for 18 years. <laughs> and some people believe his greatest contribution to the country was as a congressman. He died in the saddle. He passed out. He, he, he collapsed in the House chamber and died shortly after. 14, he started his career. And he was in almost, other than going to college and, and being a lawyer for a few years, he was in almost constant service from his teenage years until the day he died. This, this portrait is 1795. Slide over one more, Derek. This is his wife, Louisa Catherine. She is unique until January 20th, which she is going to lose something. She was born in England. She is the only, to this date, foreign-born first lady. They, they created what was called the Adams Trust, and they put the papers away for 50 years. Scholars didn't like that, and they thought they wanted to get into this collection. The most important single family collection of papers in America. As the years ticked by, a few of their friends were allowed to look at the papers. So there were a couple of historians who looked at them, but they weren't open to the public. In 1954, the Adams family decided enough time has gone by. And they gave, they transferred ownership to the Historical Society, two conditions. One, the collection would never be divided or sold. Two, it had to be published for the, for the American people. This is the result of that. We have published over 50 volumes of the papers. In order to complete the entire collection, and by the way, it's selective. We don't do everything. We pick, we pick the best. It will take, well, let me back up. Just to finish John and Abigail, it will take until 2035. Then there's two more generations after that. I retired. I could realize that I was not going to. I was not going to finish this. Uh, this work. I'm not going to finish this work. But anyway, who were these people? First of all, probably the best known of all the Adamses is this chap. It's John Adams. This picture, this pastel portrait, was taken in. 1766. Jerry, can you flip over one? Side, side, side. Uh, this beauty, you may know, Abigail, his wife. Uh, they met casually. John Adams' best friend was a man named Richard Cranch, and he was going to dinner at Abigail's father's, he was a, a minister in Weymouth, not too far from Boston. Mm. <laughs> Are you from Weymouth? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Went to dinner at the house. He just tagged, John just tagged along because Richard Cranch was eventually going to marry Abigail's older sister. When he met her, 
She was 14. He was 23. He was not impressed at first. In his diary, he made some passing remark about uh, some insignificant girl he met uh, at, uh, with his friend Richard Cranch. Things changed. As time went by, they became involved and would marry in 1764. John's nine years older than her. Flip over. This is John Adams. We'll, I'll fill in some of the blanks along the way. This is John Adams in retirement. This portrait uh, hangs in uh, the office that I uh, had at the Massachusetts Historical Society. And one more. Oops, back a little bit. The other, the other, uh, <laughs> oh, that's my wife's email. Uh, <laughs> but while, while you're finding the other thing, um, that's right, she has a server at home. Um, they saved their correspondence. They saved almost everything. So we have the earliest letter we have, and that was the next thing that was going to come up, was what we call the misadorable letter. Misadorable was the way he addressed the letter. It was a, you can make it a little larger, uh, by the same token that the, oops, you're going to hit on number five. Um, He's asking for more kisses and stuff. This, this, is, the case. this is John Adams. This is this, the guy that becomes president. Anyway, he was sort of a romantic clown back in, in that time. Um, these letters were saved because of sentimental value. But as time went by and as they moved along, it wasn't just the sentimental that they saved. Their, cor their correspondence from 1762 and the last letters written in 181 Think of that period in American history. What happens in American history during that time? And the Adamses were central to much, if not most of it. In 1775, John Adams wrote to Abigail, he was at the Continental Congress, save all the letters. He knew, he realized the significance and the importance, not just of them, but what was going, what was happening at that time. And he had a sense of history. No documents, no history. So as time went by, this, these, these letters accumulate. The papers accumulate. John Adams was really not a great president. I love Adams, but I'll admit that. His career, his contribution to the country wasn't in the presidency, although he did what he could, it was as a diplomat. He was at the Continental Congress. One of the reasons that we have so much information, they saved their letters, Thomas Jefferson burned his letters from his wife when she died. Martha Washington burned George's letters. And this was very common at that time. There are three letters between George and, and, uh, um, and Martha Washington that exist only because she didn't find them when she was destroying the, the other ones. So we have, what we have for some of the people are more public papers, less intimate papers. We have 1170 letters between John and Abigail. Why do we have so many? They were apart for so long. He was at the Continental Congress, and then he had long diplomatic spells. On their 20th anniversary, she was writing to him because they weren't together. She said, do you realize we have been separated 10 of the 20 years we've been married? In 1778, John went to Europe where he was in, in, in uh, uh, the Netherlands, in France. He was one of the people who signed the peace treaty that ended the uh, uh, the, the War of uh, Independence. Um, uh, he was our first minister to Great Britain. 
between 1778 and 1787, he was back in Boston one time, and for less than a year. And what did he do while he was there? He wrote the Massachusetts Constitution. That is still in effect. So he did make a few contributions over the years. These letters meant so much to them because they were part of the public record, but also because of the intimacy. The letters convey feelings. We don't write letters anymore. Most of us don't write letters anymore. John was, they were separated one time for more than five years. The only contact were the letters. Abigail wrote after one of these long separations that she would read and reread the letters. Just hold the letters. They were that intimate. It was, that was her connection to John when they were away. No telephone, no photographs. You had those portraits that they had taken right after they were married, that's all there was. Until later in life when they became more prosperous. But during that time that they were separated, the letters were, were the connection. Another thing I think that makes the Adamses appealing is not just that we know so much about them, is that their lives were much, they had some of the same problems that we have today. For example, Abigail once said, all my geese are not swans. Have you ever heard that expression? What she meant was that all of her children were not so successful. First child, Nabby, Abigail, very quiet child, married a Revolutionary War officer a man who looked like he was on the perfect trajectory to fame and fortune. It didn't work out. The Adamses who liked him at first found that he was speculating in land. Uh, he was more interested in hunting and wearing fancy uniforms. Their life was destitute. Very sad situation. She developed breast cancer had a mastectomy at home. She died in 1813. Second son was Charles. We love Charles, interesting guy. He was an alcoholic. His life fell apart. He married, had two children, lived with a lawyer in New York. Right about the time that John Adams was leaving the presidency, he died. Tragic. They knew for years and years and years that he had a problem. Even when he was in college at Harvard, they knew he had a problem. Their youngest son, Thomas Boylston, a uh, nice guy, made along, but sort of bumbled along, lived on his father's reputation. He too was an alcoholic and died uh, too early. And then there was the swan. John Quincy Adams. Talk a little, we'll talk a little more about him in a second. Jerry, can you flip me over another one? When John and Abigail, uh, they lived in a modest home. As a matter of fact, the houses are still there. The, the one that John Adams was born in, uh, it's like a little salt box house, uh, modest beyond compare. Abigail grew up in a modest household. When they lived in Paris, that was their house. When they lived in London, they had one equally as nice. When they came back to Quincy, greater Boston area, they had to buy a larger house. But one of the things that and this is also the case with uh, uh, 
uh, John Quincy's wife, they, they had become not necessarily a custom. They were still Republicans. They still they didn't believe in a monarchy or the grandeur. But I, can't you imagine that it might have been a little difficult after several years of living this style with many servants to come back to Quincy and live on a farm? But they did it. They did it. Can you shoot another one over? I picked this letter. This is a letter from Abigail to Martha Washington right after John has uh, been elected president. And she, I, I'm reminded of Mrs. Trump going to the White House to talk to Mrs. Obama about transition. This is the transition letter. <laughs> Abigail is saying, oh, you're so great, and I know you did so, and they, because you had to entertain, and Abigail uh, uh, didn't like that she liked living on the farm. But anyway, there's another page to it. Anyway, it's, and it's a, a draft. You can see she didn't send that to, to Martha Washington. This is her, her draft of the letter. She's asking for advice of being the first lady. So they had a transition at that time, but it was, was a little less uh, formal. Okay. You slip over another one. Um, this is a letter that John Adams wrote first day in the, in the White House. Well, they didn't call it the White House, they called it the President's Mansion at that time. It's scholars. It's a great job. You know, I'm sort of retired. Anyway, sir. Oh, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Don't worry. You got the, that, was the la that was the last thing. And thank you for your attention. I'll take any questions you might have. Explained it all too well. Oh. <laughs> Over there. If you would, if you would raise your hand, and then we can give you the mic, <laughs> so everyone can hear. Why? Why did John and Abigail? Where were they? I mean, John and Abigail. They were. John and Abigail. Where were they separated? There were children at home and a farm to run. Somebody had to take care of it. So many years, why didn't he take her? Well, he, eventually she came over. She came to uh, <coughs> France. The first, well, let me tell you about one of, one of my favorite letters. He, he left in 1778, came home once in 1779, went back, and he didn't come back until 87. She came over in 84. So they spent several years together, or at least a few years together, some in Paris, some in London. But it wasn't, it, one of the things is that it was a treacherous, uh, crossing the Atlantic at that time was a treacherous journey. Plus, much of the time that they were separated, it was wartime. And when she came over, she came over with her daughter, uh, Navi. This is one of the things about the contribution that they made is that they were, they gave so much of their lives that people people don't think about now. It wasn't just the distance. It was a difference. It was time and time and distance was different at that time. I go from Boston to Washington for meetings and come home at night. That was a several weeks trip each way back in 1800. So it's very, it's, sometimes it's hard for us to relate to those people because, as I say, time and distance was so different at that time. I envy you your intimacy with this material. Very exciting. I have a question about, I guess slavery would be the word. So the country's about 300 years into slavery at the time of John Quincy Adams. Yes. And I suspect from the reading you've done, you know if the War of Independence was about maintaining slavery in the U.S. or was it really about taxation without representation? Slavery was not, slavery was not a large question then. It became a greater question after the war. 
as they were going to create, because by the time the war was over, uh, Massachusetts uh, uh, had outlawed slavery, and some of the other northern states had set up plans for gradual emancipation. They didn't, they didn't all just end slavery right away. When the Constitution was being developed in Philadelphia in the summer of 87, this was a question that they had to skirt. They wanted to bring all the states together, but if you pressed slavery as an issue, it wasn't going to work. So they did this little dance around slavery at that time. Abigail disliked Southerners. She made fun of Southerners and, and, and at different things. So once again, I'm paraphrasing. If we're fighting for freedom, how can the Virginians, and she picked on Virginians, um, how could the Virginians say that they were fighting for freedom when they held so many people in slavery? There was one uh, uh, letter where John is, in, is president, she's back in Quincy. This is another thing, is that they didn't live together all the time. She would go back for long periods of time to Massachusetts when he was working either in Philadelphia or Washington. Part of it was she had to oversee what was going on back at the farm, or farms, they had farms by this time. Uh, and also her health was not always good. When they were in Philadelphia, you didn't want to be in Philadelphia in the summer because yellow fever uh, epidemics would break out and thousands of people would die. Philadelphia was cleared out in the summertime. The only people who stayed there were the people who couldn't leave. Anyway, she wrote a letter to John saying that she had some black servants, not slaves, servants. And she had one named James. She sent him to the public school, or the, what, the equivalent of a public school. The other young men didn't want him in the class. She wrote to John saying what she had done, and it was, bring them to me, I'll take care of it. She wasn't going to put up with it. So there's a much, there's a much different New England attitude, and I think Abigail is the epitome of the New England woman at that time. Now, one of the things we assume that, we have so much written by Abigail. We hope that she was similar to other, other ladies at that time. Uh, didn't she have a financial struggle, too, with the farm, keeping them afloat? Wasn't it kind of Abigail's? Right. This is, this is a couple of things about Abigail and money. Um, John liked to invest in land. He was a farmer at heart. She invested in stocks and bonds. She knew, as Hamilton did, that the country in time would be solvent. And that a lot of the, of the paper money was, was heavily discounted at that time because people didn't have a lot of faith. She bought that stuff up left and right. She had a good sense. But this is something, and this is something, once again, that's really hard for us to understand today. And that is, when a president leaves uh, the presidency now, it's better than a golden parachute. I mean, you're, you're taken care of forever. John worked on the farm. He had to keep things going. And some of their money was invested. John Quincy had taken care of some of their money when he was the, the US minister to England, had invested in a, comp or in a banking firm, uh, Bird, Savage Bird, I think was the name of it. Anyway, they went under. And they lost a lot of money. John Quincy Adams made it right. But for a while, it was sort of touch and go. They, retirement was, retirement in 181, was not like, like I say, Mr. Obama, Mr. Clinton, uh, Mr. Bush. Some of them were wealthy to start with, but anybody who leaves the presidency now doesn't have to worry about money. They did at that time. Several of us, I think, enjoyed that series with Paul Giamatti a few years ago. Did you have a, an opinion on whether that was historically Pretty accurate, or? Yes, but let me, uh, uh, it was, because we worked with them on that. That's based on David McCullough's uh, uh, John Adams, who, if you, if you still have that book at home, look at his acknowledgments. He starts off by crediting us. All right. Uh, 
Well, let me, let, me, let me tell you one other little story about that. McCullough was going to do a biography of Jefferson. The, uh, the Massachusetts Historical Society has a large collection of Jefferson letters, over 7,000. He came to look at them, and while he was there, he flipped through some of the Adam stuff. Put Jefferson aside. <laughs> also, he has a, he has a home uh, in Nantucket, and he refers to it as the house that John Adams built. <laughs> but I'm sorry, I, 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 yes, it, it, was, it, was ac it was accurate, except every once in a while something would come up and I, and I would say something. My wife wouldn't watch it with me anymore. <laughs> I'd say, oh, he wasn't there that day, or, or that couldn't have happened. Or, so we watched it separately. Uh, other questions? Uh, was that the one from PBS in about 1970 or 71? Uh, yes, we we can. Oh no! Oh, that was uh, the Adams Chronicles. Okay, great. That's the Adams Chronicles. Been long time that was that. that was before my time. That was before my time. But yes, we we that is our office uh, helped with that. There was another one on John and Abigail about 2005 on the American Experience, and their 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 publicity was America's first power couple. Good. Any other questions? Thanks Thank so much. Anyone who can help gather up the chairs and put them on the mat tracks.